Hippias Major. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Hippias Major by Plato. Translated by George Burgess. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates and Hippias. Socrates. O oh, thou, the handsome and clever Hippias, after how long a time hast thou now again arrived at Athens? Hippias. I have had no leisure time, Socrates, for when Ellis wants to transact any business with any other state, she always comes to me the first, selecting me as an ambassador from the citizens, from her conceiving that I am the most competent to be a judge of the arguments urged by each of the states, and to report upon them. Hence I have often gone to other cities as an ambassador, but most frequently, and on points the most in number, and of greatest importance, to Lacedaemon. Hence it is why, as regards your question, I do not often come to these parts. Socrates. This it is, Hippias, to be a person truly wise and accomplished. For as a private individual you are able to obtain no little money from young men, and to impart more benefit than you receive, and as a public man are able to do your own state good service, as he should do, who would not be held in contempt, but be in good repute with the many. But, Hippias, what is the reason why those men of the olden time, whose names are so renowned for wisdom, Pittacus and Bias, and Thales of Miletus, and his disciples, and those who come after, down to Anaxagoras, appear all, or most of them, to have kept aloof from public affairs. Hippias. What else, Socrates, can you suppose, than that they were unable, or not sufficiently fit, to reach by their intellect to both subjects, public and private? Socrates. Shall we then, by Zeus, affirm, that as the other arts have improved, and the operatives of former times were of no mark as compared with those of the present, so the art of you, sophists, has improved likewise, and that those of the ancients who were engaged in the study of wisdom were persons of no mark in comparison with you? Hippias, you speak perfectly correctly. Socrates, if then, Hippias, were biased to come now to life again, he would be exposed to ridicule as compared with you, just as our modern statuaries assert that Daedalus, were he alive to execute such works as those from which he gained his great name, would become ridiculous? Hippias. It is as you say, Socrates. I am, however, accustomed myself to praise highly the men of the olden time, or even our immediate predecessors before, and, more than the moderns, acting with a feeling of caution as regards the envy of the living, and of fear as regards the anger of the dead. Socrates. Correctly, Hippias, as it seems to me, are you thinking upon and considering the matter? And I too can testify that you are speaking the truth, and that your art has in reality improved in enabling you to transact public affairs conjointly with private. For Gorgias, the great sophist of Leontium, came hither on an embassy from his country, as being the man most competent among the Leontines to transact public affairs and was thought to speak the best before the people here, and at the same time, by making a display of his powers in private, and associating with young men, he gained and carried away great sums of money from this city. Or, if you wish for another instance, our friend, Prodicus himself, has frequently come hither in a public capacity from elsewhere, but on arriving the last time, not long since, publicly from chaos, and speaking before the council, he was held in high repute, and, by making a display of his powers in private, and associating with young men, he gained a wonderful heap of money. But of those ancient sages, not one ever thought proper to demand money by way of a fee for making a display of their wisdom before persons of all climes. Such simpletons were they, and so completely did it escape them that money was a thing of great value whereas each of the preceding made more money from his wisdom than has any operative in whatever trade you will, and even prior to these did Protagoras. Hippias. 
you know nothing socrates about these beautiful things for if you knew how much money i have made you would be amazed the other instances i pass by but having gone once to sicily while protagoras was residing there in high repute and rather advanced in years i did although much younger gain in a very short time more than one hundred fifty mina nay from inucum a very small town i took above twenty this when i arrived home i carried and gave to my father so that it struck him and the rest of the citizens with wonder and astonishment and i almost think i have made more money than any two sophists together whom you choose to name socrates you bring forward hippias truly a good and great proof both of your own wisdom and of the men of the present day how superior they are as compared with those of the olden time for of your predecessors down to anaxagoras great is proclaimed the folly according to your statement for to anaxagoras they say happened the very opposite to what has befallen you for of the great wealth left him he took no care and lost it all in so silly a manner did he act the sophist and of the other ancient sages other stories of a similar kind are told you seem then to produce this as a good proof of the wisdom of the moderns as compared with the ancients and many indeed agree with you that the wise man should be wise for himself especially and of such a person this is the one definition he who can make the most money let this then suffice and now tell me from which of the cities whither you went did you gain the greatest money is it not plain it was from sparta whither you went the oftenest hippias not by zeus from thence socrates socrates how say you the least then hippias never anything at all socrates a monstrous and marvellous account you are giving hippias but tell me has not that wisdom of yours the power to make those who associate with you and learn it better as regards virtue hippias yes very much so socrates socrates were you then able to make the sons of the Inutians better, but unable to make the sons of the Spartans? Hippias, far from it. Socrates, are the Siciliots desirous of becoming better, but the Spartans not? Hippias, the Lacedaemonians are, Socrates, very desirous. Socrates, was it then from their want of money that they shunned your society? Hippias, by no means, for they have enough of it. Socrates, what then could it be? that although they were desirous of virtue and had money and you were able to benefit them to the greatest extent they did not send you away loaded with wealth was it that the lacedaemonians can educate their sons better than you shall we say this and do you concede it is so hippias by no manner of means socrates were you then unable to persuade the young men at lacedaemon that by associating with you they would make a greater progress in virtue than by associating with their own people or were you unable to persuade their fathers that they ought to hand over their children to you rather than take that care upon themselves if they had any regard for their children for surely they did not grudge their sons becoming as virtuous as possible hippias i do not think they felt any grudge socrates in good truth lacedaemon is a well-regulated city hippias how not socrates now in well-regulated cities virtue is most highly prized hippias certainly socrates and to impart this to another you know the best of all men hippias by much so socrates socrates now would not the man who could best impart the art of horsemanship be the most honoured and acquire the most wealth in thessaly or wherever else in greece this art is cultivated the most hippias it is likely socrates will he then who can impart instruction of the greatest value with respect to virtue be honoured the most and make the most money if he wishes it not at lacedaemon and any other of the well-regulated states in greece but in sicily rather as you think my friend or at inucum shall we hippias give credit to this for if you command i must do so hippias it is not socrates the custom of the country for the lacedaemonians to disturb their laws 
nor to educate their children contrary to established usages. Socrates, how say you? Think you that it is the custom of the country for the Lacedaemonians not to act correctly, but to do wrong? Hippias, I would not say so, Socrates. Socrates, would they not do right then to educate their sons in the better way, and not in the worse? Hippias, they would do right, but it is not lawful for them to give a foreign education, since, rest assured, that if any one else ever took away money from thence by teaching, I should have taken by much the most, for they delight greatly in listening to me, and give me praise. But what I am saying is not law. Socrates, Say you, Hippias, that the law is an injury or a benefit to a state. Hippias, it is enacted, I presume, for a benefit, but sometimes the law, when improperly enacted, does an injury. Socrates, what then? Do not they who enact a law lay it down as the greatest good to a state? For without law it is impossible to live in a state of good government. Hippias, you speak the truth. Socrates, when, therefore, they who undertake to frame laws fail in procuring a good, they have missed what is lawful and law? Or how say you? Hippias. Accurately speaking, Socrates, such is the case, but men are not used to give that name. Socrates. Do you mean, Hippias, those who know the truth, or who do not know it? Hippias. I mean the many. Socrates. Are the many, then, those who know the truth? Hippias. Certainly not, Socrates, but surely they who do know it do in reality conceive that what is to all men more beneficial is more agreeable to law than what is less beneficial. Or do not you grant this? Hippias, I grant that they do hold so in reality. Socrates, do not things exist and are in the state as those who are knowing conceive? Hippias, undoubtedly. Socrates. Now it is, as you assert, more beneficial for the Lacedaemonians to receive a foreign education under yourself than after the system of their own country. Hippias. And I assert the truth. Socrates. Because what is more beneficial is more conformable to law. And this Hippias, do you say? Hippias. I have so said. Socrates. According, then, to your reasoning, it is more conformable to law for the sons of the Lacedaemonians to be instructed by Hippias, and less so by their fathers, if perchance they shall in reality be more benefited under you. Hippias, and benefited they would be, Socrates. Socrates, the Lacedaemonians, then, act contrary to law in not giving you their gold and committing their sons to your care. Hippias, in this I agree with you, for you seem to produce an argument in my favour, and there is no need for me to oppose it. Socrates, we find then, my friend, the Lacedaemonians to act contrary to law, and this too in matters of the greatest moment, they who are thought to be most observant of law. And yet, by the gods, did they praise you, and were delighted at hearing, what? Or is it not evident that the subjects were those which you know the best, relating to the stars, and celestial events. Hippias, not at all. Such subjects they cannot endure. Socrates, but they delight in hearing something about geometry. Hippias, not at all, for many of them know not, so to say, even how to reckon. Socrates, they are then far from enduring you while making a display on the keeping of accounts. Hippias, very far indeed by Zeus. Socrates, but the subjects, then, were those in which you can the most accurately of all men draw distinctions, respecting the powers of letters and syllables, and rhythms and harmonies. Hippias, what harmonies or letters, my good man? Socrates, what, then, are the subjects which they gladly hear from you and commend? Tell me yourself, since I cannot find them. Hippias, respecting the genealogy, Socrates, of their heroes and men, and settlements of tribes, and how cities were founded of old, and, in a word, to everything relating to archaeology they listen with the greatest pleasure, so that I was forced to learn my lesson myself thoroughly for their sakes, and to practice myself well on those points. Socrates. 
by zeus hippias you were fortunate in that the lacedaemonians did not take a delight in hearing a man who could reckon up our archons from the time of solon for otherwise you would have had some trouble in learning the list hippias how so socrates upon hearing fifty names only once i can repeat them from memory socrates you speak the truth but i did not bear in mind that you had a system of mnemonics so that i understand why reasonably enough the lacedaemonians are pleased with you as being a person who knows many things and they make use of you as children do of old women to tell them pretty stories hippias and by zeus socrates i was lately in high repute there by going through a lecture upon the honourable pursuits to which a young person should devote himself for i have by me a very beautiful discourse upon that subject well put together in other respects and in the words the form and commencement of the discourse is something of this kind after troy was taken the story goes that neoptolemus inquired of nestor what were the honourable pursuits a young man should follow to gain a good name upon this nestor is the speaker and suggests a great many and very excellent precepts laid down by law of this dissertation i made a display there and on the third day hence i intend to display it here and several other pieces of mine worth the hearing in the school of philostratus for so has eutychus the son of apimantus requested see then that you are present yourself and bring with you others who on hearing will be competent to decide upon what is then said socrates this if a god is willing hippias shall be but at present answer me a short question relating to it for you have opportunely put me in mind of it a certain person has thou best of men very lately during some conversations thrown me into a difficulty when i was finding fault with some things as being ugly and praising others as being beautiful by asking me in a very saucy manner from whence do you socrates know said he what things are beautiful and what ugly come then tell me if you can say a word what is the beautiful and i through my want of wit was at a loss and had it not in my power to answer him with propriety so quitting his company i grew angry with and vented reproaches upon myself and threatened that the first time i met with any of you wise men i would hear his opinion and learn it and after studying it thoroughly that i would return to my questioner and fight out again the matter with him now therefore as i said you are come opportunely and do you instruct me sufficiently what is beauty in the abstract and endeavour to give me as accurately as possible your answers in order that i may not be confuted a second time and pay the penalty of a laugh against myself for assuredly you know it quite clearly and it would be but a mite of the learning with which you are conversant on so many points hippias by zeus a mite indeed socrates and so to say of no value at all socrates easily then shall i learn it and no one will hereafter confute me hippias not one indeed for otherwise mean would be my profession and suited to a common person socrates by juno hippias you speak bravely if we shall get the man into our clutches but shall i be any hindrance by imitating him if i lay hold of your arguments while answering me in order that you may exercise me the most for i am nearly skilful in laying hold of arguments if then it makes no difference to you i am willing to lay hold of them in order that i may learn with greater strength hippias take hold then for as i said just now the question is not a great one and i will teach you to answer questions much more difficult than this so that not a single person will be ever able to confute you socrates ye gods how bravely you talk but come since you bid me i will become him and as well as i can try to question you now if you shall give the lecture you mention upon beautiful pursuits he will after hearing it when you have ceased speaking inquire about nothing else except about the beautiful for such a habit he has and he will say art not see thou stranger from ellis the just just through justness 
Answer now, Hippias, as if he were questioning you. Hippias, I answer through justness. Socrates, there is then such a thing as justness? Hippias, clearly so. Socrates, are not then the wise wise through wisdom, and all that is good good through goodness? Hippias, how not? Socrates, by those things existing really, for it is not surely by their non-existing. Hippias, by their existing really. Socrates, are not all things that are beautiful, beautiful through beauty? Hippias, yes, through beauty. Socrates, by such a thing existing? Hippias, by its existing, for what should it be? Socrates, tell me now, stranger, he will say, what is this beauty? Hippias, does he who asks this question want to know what is a beautiful thing? Socrates, I think not, Hippias, but what is beauty? Hippias, how does this differ from that? Socrates, seems there to you no difference? Hippias, there is not any difference. Socrates, but however it is evident that you know better, consider, however good, sir, the question well. For he asks you, not what is a beautiful thing, but what is beauty. Hippias, I understand you, good sir, and I will answer his question, what is beauty? Nor shall I ever be confuted. For rest assured, Socrates, if the truth must be told that a beautiful maiden is a beautiful thing. Socrates, by the dog you have answered Hippias, beautifully and gloriously. Shall I then, when I answer thus, have answered the question correctly, and shall I never be refuted? Hippias, for how could you be refuted, Socrates, on that point which seems correct to all the world, and where all who hear you will testify in your favor that you are speaking properly? Socrates, be it so then, by all means. But come, Hippias, let me consider again with myself what you are saying, for the man will question me in some such manner as this. Come, Socrates, answer me. If beauty exists in the abstract, all those things which you say are beautiful, would these be beautiful? And I will then say that, if a beautiful maiden be a beautiful thing, through which the things would be beautiful. Hippias, think you then, that he will still attempt to confute you by asserting that what you say is beautiful is not so, or that, should he attempt it, he will not be laughed down. Socrates, that he will, thou wondrous man, I am well assured. But whether, after making the attempt, he will be laughed down, the thing itself will show. However, I wish to tell you what he will say. Hippias, tell it then. Socrates, what a sweet creature, Socrates, he will say you are. Is not a beautiful mare, which even a god has praised in an oracle, a beautiful thing? What shall we answer, Hippias? Shall we say aught else, then, that the mare is beautiful? At least the beautiful. For how shall we dare to deny that a beautiful thing is beautiful? Hippias, you speak, Socrates, what is true, especially since the god rightly said it, for with us there are mares very beautiful. Socrates, be it so, he will say, but what? Is not a beautiful liar a beautiful thing? Shall we allow it, Hippias? Hippias, yes. Socrates, and after this he will say, as, guessing from his usual manner, I nearly know full well, my excellent fellow, is not a beautiful soup-dish a beautiful thing? Hippias, who is this man, Socrates? What an uneducated fellow, who thus presumes to express himself in words so low in an affair so solemn? Socrates, such is the fellow Hippias, not a fine gentleman, but a man of the mob, who cares for nothing but truth. He must, however, have an answer, and I appear speaking for him. If the soup-dish be made by a skilful potter, smooth and round, and well-baked, like some of the beautiful soup-dishes with two handles, containing six coos, very beautiful, if he inquires about such a soup-dish, we must confess it to be beautiful. For how could we say that what is beautiful is not beautiful? Hippias, not at all, Socrates. Socrates, is not a beautiful soup-dish, then, he will say, a beautiful thing? Answer, Hippias, but, Socrates, the case is, I think, this. Even such a vessel, when beautifully made, is a beautiful thing. 
but this taken as a whole does not deserve to be considered as beautiful as compared with a mare and a maiden and the other things of beauty socrates be it so i understand you hippias that we must thus reply to the person who put such a question you are ignorant my man that correct is the saying of heraclitus that the most beautiful ape as compared with another kind is ugly and that the most beautiful of soup dishes is ugly as compared with the maiden kind as says hippias the wise is it not so hippias hippias you have answered socrates quite correctly socrates here then for i know well he will say after this what then socrates should any one compare maiden kind with god kind would he not be in the same case as when the maiden kind was compared to the soup dish kind would not the most beautiful maiden appear ugly or does not heraclitus whom you bring forward say this very same thing that the wisest of men when compared with a god appears an ape in wisdom and beauty and everything else shall we confess hippias the most beautiful maiden is ugly as compared with the god kind hippias yes for who socrates would gainsay this at least socrates should however we confess this he will laugh and say do you then remember socrates what you were asked i shall reply i do it was this what is beauty in the abstract whereupon he will rejoin when you are asked about beauty in the abstract you answer by mentioning that which happens to be as you say yourself not more beautiful than ugly so it seems i shall say or what else my friend do you advise me to say hippias this i advise you for that the human kind as compared with the gods is not beautiful he will say the truth socrates if i had asked you at the outset he will say what is a thing beautiful and ugly had you answered me as you have done just now would you not have answered correctly and still does it seem to you that the beautiful itself by which everything else is decorated and looks beautiful whenever that species of beauty is present to it is a maiden or a mare or a liar hippias if this socrates he is seeking it is of all things the easiest for me to tell him in answer what is that beauty by which all other things are decorated and by which being present they appear beautiful the man is the greatest simpleton and knows nothing about beautiful chattels for if you tell him in answer that the beautiful about which he is inquiring is nothing else than gold he will be in a difficulty and not attempt to confute you for we all surely know that wherever gold is present to a thing how ugly soever it may have seemed before it will appear beautiful when it is decorated at least with gold socrates you have no experience of the man hippias how difficult he is and admitting nothing easily hippias what matters it socrates for what is correctly asserted he must admit or not admitting it be laughed at socrates and yet he will not only not admit this answer thou best of men but he will treat me with derision and say o oh, thou puffed up with conceit thinkest thou that phidias was a bad workman and i shall reply i think so by no manner of means hippias and you will answer rightly socrates socrates rightly indeed hereupon when i have confessed that phidias was a good workman he will say do you imagine then that phidias was ignorant of that which you call the beautiful why say you this especially i shall reply because he will rejoin if phidias has made the eyes of athene not of gold nor yet the rest of her face nor the feet nor even the hands since a thing of gold would have looked the most beautiful but not of ivory it is evident that he erred in this through ignorance not knowing that gold is that which makes all things beautiful wherever it is present when he says this what answer hippias shall we give him hippias the answer is not difficult for we will see that he acted rightly for ivory is i presume beautiful likewise socrates why then he will rejoin did he not make the middle part of the eyes of ivory but of stone having found in the stone a similarity as great as was possible to ivory or is a beautiful stone a beautiful thing shall we say so hippias hippias 
we will say so if it is becoming socrates but where it is unbecoming it is ugly shall i confess it or not hippias confess at least when it the stone is not becoming socrates what then he will say do not ivory and gold thou wise acre when they are becoming cause things to appear beautiful but when not ugly shall we deny this or acknowledge the man to be in the right hippias we must acknowledge this at least that whatever is becoming to any individual thing causes it to appear beautiful socrates when then he will say some one shall have cooked the beautiful soup dish of which we have been speaking full of beautiful porridge whether does a ladle of gold become it or one of fig tree wood hippias by hercules of what kind of fellow socrates are you speaking will you not tell me who he is socrates no for you would not know him should i tell you his name hippias but i know already that he is some ignorant fellow socrates he is a man of much thought hippias but however what shall we say which of the two ladles becomes the porridge and the soup dish or is it clearly the one of fig tree wood for this makes the porridge of a pleasanter flavour and at the same time my friend it would not by breaking the soup dish let the porridge run out and extinguish the fire and cause the guests just about to feast on it to be without a very noble dish but all this the one of gold would do so that it seems to me we ought to say that the one of fig tree wood is more becoming than the one of gold unless indeed you say otherwise hippias it is indeed socrates more becoming but for my part i would not converse with a fellow who asked such questions as these socrates and rightly so my friend for it would not become you to be polluted with such dirty words you in a dress so beautiful and with such beautiful sandals and in such high repute amongst all the greeks for wisdom but for me it is nothing to mix myself up with the dirt of the man teach me then beforehand and for my sake give a reply for the man will say if the ladle of fig tree wood be indeed more becoming than the one of gold is it not more beautiful especially since you have confessed that the becoming is more beautiful than the unbecoming shall we confess that the ladle of fig tree wood is more beautiful than the one of gold hippias do you wish me socrates to say that by saying which i think you will free yourself from his much talking socrates by all means but not before you tell me which of the two ladles that we have been speaking of is the more becoming and more beautiful hippias well then if you will tell him in answer that it is the one made from the fig tree socrates now say what you were just about to say for in this answer by which i assert that gold is the beautiful gold will not as it seems to me appear to be at all a thing more beautiful than fig tree wood but what do you now say is the beautiful hippias i will tell you for you seem to me to seek to answer a question of this kind what is that beauty which at no time and in no place will appear ugly to any one socrates by all means hippias and now you understand me perfectly well hippias listen then for rest assured that if any man has anything to say against this i will say that i know nothing whatever socrates by the gods then tell it as quickly as possible hippias i assert then that it is at all times and to all persons and in all places the most beautiful thing for a man in wealth health and in honour amongst the greeks and having reached old age and having laid his deceased parents handsomely in the grave to be buried himself by his own children in a handsome and splendid manner socrates capital hippias how wondrous well and gorgeously and how worthy of yourself have you spoken and by juno i am delighted with you for the good will with which as far as you can you assist me but we do not as yet reach the man's mind but he will laugh the most at us rest assured hippias truly a silly laugh socrates for when he shall have nothing to say against this and merely laugh he will laugh at himself and be the laughing-stock of all who are present socrates such perhaps will be the case perhaps however after such an answer there will be a danger as i prophesy of his not merely laughing at me hippias 
What then? Socrates, that, should he happen to have a staff in his hand, unless I escape from him by flight, he will endeavor to reach me with a smart blow. Hippias, how say you? Is the man a master of yours? And will he not, for having done so, be brought to trial and pay damages? Or is your state not under the laws of justice, and permits the citizens to beat each other unjustly? Socrates, by no manner of means does it permit them. Hippias, will he then not suffer punishment for striking you unjustly? Socrates, I think not, Hippias, not at all, if I gave such an answer, but justly, as it seems to me. Hippias, it seems then so to me, Socrates, especially since you are of that opinion yourself. Socrates, shall I then state why I think I should be justly beaten on giving such an answer? Or will you too beat me without a trial? Or will you receive a reason? Hippias, it would be hard indeed, Socrates, if I did not receive it. But how say you? Socrates, I will speak to you in the same manner as I did just now, when imitating that person, in order that I may not say to you what he will to me, words both harsh and producing an angry feeling. For rest assured, he will say, Tell me, Socrates, do you think a person would receive blows unjustly, who should chaunt such a long rigmarole, little in unison with, and far distant from, the question proposed? How so, I shall reply. How, he will rejoin? Cannot you remember that I asked you, What is the beauty that enables everything to which it is present to become beautiful, be it stone, or wood, or man, or god, or any act, or any science? For I am asking man, what is beauty in the abstract, and yet I am no more able to bawl anything into you than if you were lying by my side a stone, and this too a millstone, without ears and brains. Now, Hippias, would not you be annoyed if I, in a fright, were to say after this abuse, Nay, it was Hippias who said that this was the beautiful, although I asked him, as you do me, what is the beautiful to all persons and things, and at all times. What say you? Will you not be annoyed if I say so? Hippias, I am quite certain, Socrates, that what I said is the beautiful in every case, will appear so. Socrates, but will it be so, he will say, for surely the beautiful must always be beautiful. Hippias, certainly. Socrates, and always was so, he will say. Hippias, it was. Socrates, did the Elian stranger assert, he will say, that it was a beautiful thing for Achilles to be buried after his progenitors, and for his grandfather, Aeacus, and the others born of the gods, and even the gods themselves? Hippias, what is this? Hurl him to the blessed land. Such questions as these of the fellow Socrates are not to be spoken even as being of ill omen. Socrates, how so? It is surely no very ill-omened speech when one person asks a question for the other to say. Such is the fact. Hippias, perhaps so. Socrates, perhaps then you are the man he will say who asserts that it is a beautiful thing for every person and at all times to be buried by his descendants and to bury his parents. Now was not Hercules one of the all? And those two whom we have just now mentioned. Hippias, but I did not say it was so for the gods. Socrates, nor for the heroes, as it seems. Hippias, nor for such as were children of the gods. Socrates, but for such only as were not. Hippias, certainly. Socrates, according to your reasoning, then, it seems, that amongst the heroes it was a grievous and unholy thing for Tantalus and Dardanus and Zethus, but to Pelops and to the others so born it was a beautiful thing. Hippias, so it seems to me. Socrates, it seems then to you, he will say, what you have lately denied, that to some persons and at some times it is not a beautiful thing after burying their progenitors to be buried by their progeny, and further, as it seems, that this cannot take place to all and be a beautiful thing, so that this very thing is in the same case as those before, namely the maiden in the soup-dish, and still more ridiculously to some it is a beautiful thing, but to others it is not beautiful. And even to-day he will say, you are unable, Socrates, to answer the question, touching the beautiful, what it is. 
in these or such like terms will he reproach me justly should i answer him in this manner for very nearly after this fashion hippias does he for the most part converse sometimes however as if in pity for my want of skill and learning he proposes a problem and asks if such a thing as this seems to be the beautiful or he talks upon any other subject which he happens to have heard and about which there is a talk hippias how say you socrates this socrates i will tell you thou godlike socrates says he do cease to give such answers and on such grounds for they are very silly and easily confuted but consider now whether the beautiful be something of that kind which we just now touched upon in the answer when we said of gold that where it is becoming it is beautiful but where not it is not so and of all the rest likewise to which the becoming may be present on the becoming then itself and on its nature do you reflect becomingly whether this happens to be the beautiful now i am accustomed in such matters to assent on every occasion for i know not what to object but does it seem to you that the becoming is the beautiful hippias assuredly completely so socrates socrates let us reflect lest we be cheated like children merely hippias it is meet to reflect socrates observe then do we call the becoming that which by its presence causes each of those things to which it may be present to appear beautiful or that which causes them to be so really or neither of these hippias it appears so to me socrates whether that which causes things to appear beautiful as when a person puts on clothes or shoes which fit him he looks more beautiful although he is a laughing-stock now if the becoming causes things to appear more beautiful than they really are the becoming must be a deception with regard to the beautiful and it would not be that which we are seeking hippias for we are in search of that by which all things beautiful are beautiful as in the case of the surpassing by which all things are great for by this all things are great and though they may not appear so yet if they do surpass they must of necessity be great so we say of the beautiful by which all things are beautiful whether they appear to be so or not now this cannot be the becoming for the becoming causes things to appear more beautiful than they really are as your reasoning says and does not suffer them to appear as they are but as i said just now that which causes them to be really beautiful whether they appear so or not this we must endeavour to tell what it is for this we are seeking if we are seeking the beautiful hippias but the becoming socrates causes by its presence things both to be and to appear beautiful socrates it is impossible then for things really beautiful not to appear to be beautiful at least when that is present which causes them to appear so hippias it is impossible socrates shall we then hippias confess that all things really beautiful both institutions and pursuits truly beautiful are reputed to be beautiful and appear so always to all men or must we say quite the contrary that they are unknown and that dissension and contest take place respecting these points most of all both amongst individuals privately and publicly amongst states hippias in this way rather socrates that they are unknown socrates this would not have been unknown if the appearing to be beautiful had been added to the reality and added it would have been had the becoming been the beautiful and had caused things not only to be beautiful but to appear so likewise so that the becoming if it were that which causes things to be beautiful would be that beauty in the abstract of which we are in search and not which causes things to appear beautiful but if on the other hand the becoming merely causes things to appear only beautiful it cannot be the beautiful of which we are in search for this causes them to be so really now 
to cause things to appear to be beautiful and to be really so is not in the power of the same thing nor of anything else whatever let us then choose whether you think the becoming causes things to appear beautiful or to be so really hippias i think socrates to appear so socrates alas gone and fled away from us hippias has the knowledge of what the beautiful is especially since the becoming has been seen to be a thing different from the beautiful hippias so by zeus it has socrates and to me at least very unexpectedly socrates but let us not my friend give up seeking for it for i have still some hope that what the beautiful is will appear again hippias altogether assuredly socrates for it is not difficult to find at least i know well that were i to retire into solitude for a little time and commune with myself i should describe it to you more accurately than accuracy itself socrates hold hippias talk not so big you see what trouble it has given us already lest it should grow angry with us and run away still further than before and yet i am saying nothing to the purpose for you will i think easily find it out when you come to be alone and do by the gods find it out in my presence but if you are willing seek it as now with me and if we find it it will be the best of all but if we do not i shall be content i think with my misfortune while you going away will find it easily but if we find it now depend upon it i shall not trouble you by inquiring what that was which you had discovered by yourself for the present consider it if it seems to you to be the beautiful i say that it is but keep your eye on me and give me all your attention that i may not say anything silly let then that which is useful be for us the beautiful and this i say from thinking on these points the eyes we say are beautiful not when they seem to be such but are unable to see but when they are able and useful for seeing is it not so hippias it is socrates say we not then of the whole body thus that one part of it is beautiful for running another for wrestling and further that all the animal kind as a beautiful horse and a cock and a quail and all utensils and vehicles for land and sea ships and triremes and all instruments both for music and the other arts and pursuits and laws and nearly everything we call beautiful are in the same position and looking to each of them in what way it has been born made or laid down we speak of a thing which is useful as being beautiful in what it is useful and for what it is useful and when it is useful but another thing which is entirely useless we call not beautiful does it not so seem to you hippias hippias to me it does socrates correctly then do we now say that the useful happens to be more than all beautiful hippias correctly socrates socrates now is not each thing which is able to effect anything useful so far as it is able but that which is unable useless hippias entirely so socrates power then is beautiful and want of power is not beautiful hippias very much so and the rest of things socrates testify in our favour that such is the case but particularly as regards matters of state for of all things it is the most beautiful for a person to be powerful in state affairs and in his own city but to be powerless the least so socrates you say well by the gods then hippias is not wisdom on this account the most beautiful of all things and ignorance the least so hippias what else do you think socrates socrates softly my dear friend since i have a fear about what i am saying hippias what do you fear socrates for your reasoning has proceeded very beautifully at present socrates i wish it had but do you consider this with me could a person do anything of which he knows nothing and for which he has no power hippias by no means for how could he do that for which he has no power socrates 
are then they who err and act wrong and do a thing unwillingly other than those who would not have so acted unless they had possessed the power hippias it is evident socrates but however they who are powerful are powerful through power for assuredly it is not through want of power hippias certainly not socrates all then who do anything are able to do what they do hippias yes socrates and all men beginning from boyhood do many more evil things than good and err unwillingly hippias the fact is so socrates what then shall we say that this power and these means however useful they may be for the doing evil are beautiful or do they want much of being so hippias they want much in my opinion socrates socrates the powerful then and the useful hippias are not it seems the beautiful hippias if indeed socrates it has power to do good or is useful for things of that kind socrates away then has fled that thing at once the powerful and the useful as being without exception beautiful now this was that very thing hippias which our soul meant to say that the beautiful consists in utility and the power to produce some good hippias so it seems to me socrates now this is the advantageous is it not hippias it is socrates thus then beautiful bodies and beautiful institutions and wisdom and all these things we just now mentioned are beautiful because advantageous hippias evidently so socrates the advantageous then appears to be hippias to us the beautiful hippias entirely so socrates socrates but the advantageous is that which affects a good hippias it is socrates now that which affects is nothing else than a cause is it not hippias it is so socrates the beautiful therefore is a cause of the good hippias it is so socrates now the cause hippias and that of which it is the cause are different for the cause cannot surely be a cause of a cause consider it in this way did not the cause appear to be a maker hippias clearly socrates that which is made by the maker is nothing else but the produced but is not itself the maker hippias such is the fact socrates the produced then is one thing and the producer is another hippias yes socrates the producer then is not the cause of itself but of that which is produced by it hippias entirely so socrates if then the beautiful is the cause of a good such a good must be produced by the beautiful and for this reason as it seems we attend to intelligence and all other beautiful things because their work and issue are worthy of attention as being the good and from what we are discovering the beautiful is near to being in the form as it were of a father to the good hippias entirely so for you speak beautifully socrates socrates say i not this too beautifully that neither is the father the son nor is the son the father hippias beautifully indeed socrates nor is the cause the thing produced nor is on the other hand the thing produced the cause hippias you say what is true socrates by zeus then thou best of men neither is the beautiful the good nor is the good the beautiful or does it seem to you from what has been said that it is possible hippias by zeus it appears to me not possible socrates does it then please us and are we willing to assert that the beautiful is not good nor the good beautiful hippias by zeus it does not please me at all socrates and by zeus hippias to me too it pleases the least of all the assertions we have made hippias and reasonably so socrates the assertion then which just now appeared the most correct of all that the advantageous and the useful and the powerful to do some good was the beautiful runs the risk of not being so 
but if possible of being more ridiculous than the first mentioned in which we conceived the maiden and each of the things before mentioned to be the beautiful hippias it seems so indeed socrates and i too hippias have no longer where to turn myself but am at a loss have you anything to say hippias not at least for the present but as i said just now i know well that on reflection i shall find it out socrates but through my eagerness to know i seem to myself unable to wait your delay for after being somewhat in doubt i think i have just now found out a way for consider if we call that beautiful which causes us to be delighted i do not mean all pleasures but that which arises through the hearing and the sight how and for what could we contend for surely beautiful men hippias and embroidery of all kinds and pictures of animals and earthenware do when they are beautiful delight us while we look upon them and so likewise do beautiful sounds and music in general and conversations and story-telling produce the very same effect so that should we say in reply to that swaggering fellow my man of metal the beautiful is that which produces pleasure through the hearing and the sight think you that we should restrain him from his swaggering hippias what the beautiful is seems socrates to me at least to be well defined socrates what then shall we say hippias that pursuits and institutions being pleasant through the hearing or through the sight are beautiful or have they some other kind of beauty hippias these beautiful things will perhaps socrates lie hid from the man socrates but by the dog not from the person hippias before whom i should be the most ashamed to trifle and to pretend to say something to the purpose when i was saying nothing hippias who is he socrates the son of sophroniscus who would no more suffer me to say off-hand what has not been investigated than to speak as if i knew what i did not know hippias to myself too it appears since you have mentioned it that the case is different as regards institutions socrates softly hippias for we have fallen into the very same difficulty respecting the beautiful as we were in just now and we are in danger of conceiving ourselves to be in a pretty easy road hippias how say you so socrates socrates i will state what to me appears to be beautiful if indeed i am saying any to the purpose that which relates to institutions and pursuits would perhaps appear to be not removed from the sensations which arise through the hearing and sight but let us abide a while by the definition that what is through those senses pleasant is beautiful without bringing before us the question relating to institutions now should the man i mentioned or any one else ask us why have ye hippias and socrates separated from the pleasant in general that species of it in which ye say consists the beautiful and yet deny that what relates to the other sensations connected with food and drink and sexual intercourse and all the rest of such a kind are beautiful or do ye assert that these are not pleasant and that there are no pleasures at all in such sensations nor in anything else except seeing and hearing what shall we say hippias hippias we will say by all means socrates that in the other things likewise there are very great pleasures socrates why then he will say do ye take away from these pleasures really existing no less than those their very name and deprive them of the property of being beautiful because we will say there is not one who would not laugh at us were we to say that to eat is not a pleasant but a beautiful thing and to smell sweet not a pleasant thing but beautiful but with regard to sexual intercourse all would surely admit that it is to us a thing the most pleasant but it is meet so to carry it on if a person will do it as that no one see him since it is a deed the most disgraceful to behold on our saying this hippias he will perhaps remark i now perceive that you have been of old ashamed to say that these pleasures are beautiful because they do not seem so to men now i did not ask what seems to be beautiful to the multitude but what is so in reality 
whereupon we shall, I presume, state in reply, that we asserted that this part of the pleasant, arising from the sight and hearing, was a beautiful thing. But have you it in your power to use the reasoning for anything, or shall we, Hippias, say anything else? Hippias, against what has been urged, Socrates, it is necessary to say no other than this. Socrates, truly, do ye say well, he will reply. If, then, the pleasure, coming through the sight and hearing, be a beautiful thing, that which does not happen to be a part of such pleasant sensations, it is clear, cannot be beautiful. Shall we confess it? Hippias, yes. Socrates, is, then, that which is pleasurable, he will say, through the sight, pleasurable through the sight and hearing conjointly, or that which is pleasurable through the hearing, pleasurable through the hearing and the sight conjointly. By no means, we shall answer, would that which exists through either exist through both, for this you seem to us to say, whereas we assert that each of these pleasurable things would be beautiful, taken by themselves, and both together. Should we not answer thus? Hippias, by all means, Socrates, does then, he will say, any pleasure whatever, differ from any other pleasure whatever in this, namely, in being a pleasure. For I ask not whether any pleasure is greater or less, or more or less, but whether any one differs by this very thing, in one of the pleasures being a pleasure, but the other not a pleasure. Does it not seem so to us? Hippias, for it does not seem so. Socrates, for some other reason, then, he will say, then because they are pleasures, have ye selected these from all the rest, and having some such view with regard to both, that they differ in some respect from the rest, did ye not, looking to this, say that they are beautiful? For seeing is surely not a beautiful thing on this account, that it is through seeing. For if this were the reason of its being beautiful, the other pleasure, that through hearing, would not be beautiful, as not partaking of that which is peculiar to the sense of seeing. Shall we say you speak the truth? Hippias, we will. Socrates, nor, on the other hand, is the pleasure through the hearing beautiful on this account, that it is through hearing. For, then, that through seeing would not be beautiful, as not partaking of that which is peculiar to the sense of hearing. Shall we say, Hippias, that the man, in speaking so, speaks correctly? Hippias, yes, correctly, Socrates. But both, he will rejoin, are beautiful, as you assert. For, so we say, Hippias, we do. Socrates, they have, then, something in common, and the same which causes them to be beautiful, and which belongs to both conjointly and severally to each for otherwise they would not be beautiful conjointly and severally. Give to me a reply, as if to him. Hippias, I answer, that it appears to me, as you say. Socrates, if, then, these pleasures taken conjointly are affected by any circumstance, but not so if taken separately, they could not, at least under that circumstance, be beautiful. Hippias, how could it be possible, Socrates, that when neither are affected by any circumstance whatever, that both should be affected by that by which neither is affected? Socrates, you think it is impossible? Hippias, yes, for a great want of acquaintance with the nature of those things would possess me, and of speaking the present speeches. Socrates, you speak pleasantly, Hippias, for I am in danger equally of fancying I see something so circumstanced as you aver to be impossible, but yet I see nothing clearly. Hippias, you are no danger, Socrates, but you very readily look aside. Socrates, and yet many things of such a kind appear to me before my soul, but I distrust them because they do not present themselves to you, who have made the most money of all now famed for wisdom, but only to myself who have never made any and I have an idea, my friend, that you are playing with me, and are willingly deceiving me. Such strong, and so many, Hippias, no one will know better than yourself, Socrates, whether I am playing with you or not, if you will only endeavor to tell me what are those things that have presented themselves to you, for you will be seen to say nothing to the purpose. 
for you will never find that both of us have been affected by circumstances together by which neither you nor i have been separately socrates how say you hippias but perhaps you are speaking something to the purpose and i do not understand it do you then hear from me what i wish to state more clearly for it appears to me that what neither i have been under the circumstance of being nor am nor on the other hand what you are under such a circumstance it is possible for both to be and on the other hand that other things which both of us are under the circumstance of being neither of us are hippias you appear to me socrates to exhibit in your answers again still greater wonders than when you answered before for just consider if both of us were just would not each of us be so or if each unjust would not both be so if both were in health would not each be so or if each were wearied or wounded or struck or were affected in any other way whatever would not both of us be affected in the same way still further if both of us happened to be made of gold or silver or ivory or if you will well born or wise or held in honour or old or young or in any state you will incident to man is there not a great necessity for each to be so socrates most assuredly hippias but neither do you socrates consider things as wholes nor do they with whom you are wont to converse for taking separately the beautiful and each of things existing you discuss it in your discourses cutting it into fractions and hence things of great size and of continuous length escape your observation and to such an extent have they escaped you now that you conceive there is something either circumstance or being which as regards two things taken jointly does exist but does not as regards them taken singly or on the other hand does exist as regards each taken singly but not as regards both taken jointly so illogically and inconsiderately and sillily and unreflectingly do you conduct yourselves socrates such is our condition hippias it is not what a man wishes say the persons using everywhere the proverb but what he can but you are always assisting us with your admonitions since even now before i had been thus admonished by you how sillily we conduct ourselves shall i give you still a plainer proof by stating what were our thoughts upon those points or shall i not hippias you will speak to one who knows already socrates for i am conversant with each one of those who are engaged in disputations and how they are situated still if it is more agreeable to yourself say on socrates to me indeed it will be more agreeable for we were thou best of men so silly before you said so of us as to conceive with regard to myself and you that each of us was one person and that both could not be what each was for we are not one but two persons such a simpleton was i but now we have been taught the contrary that if both together are two persons each of us also is of necessity two and that if each of us be one it is necessary for both of us to be one for by a continuous argument respecting being it is not possible according to hippias for it to be otherwise but now having been persuaded by you that whatever both of two things are this too each of them is i sit down here but first remind me hippias whether you and i are one you and i together or you are two and i two hippias what mean you socrates socrates what i say for i am afraid to speak plainly to you because you are harsh with me whenever you seem to yourself to speak something to the purpose but however tell me is not each of us one and so affected as to be one hippias certainly socrates if then each of us be one each of us must be also odd or think you that one is not an odd number hippias i think it is socrates are we then both odd being two hippias this socrates could not be socrates but both together are even is it not so hippias certainly 
Socrates, now because both together are even, is each of us on this account even? Hippias, certainly not. Socrates, it is not then necessary, as you said just now, that what we both are together we should be singly, and that what each is we should both be. Hippias, not in these cases, but in those I spoke of before. Socrates, these are sufficient, Hippias, for we must be content with these, since it appears that some things are so, but others not. For I stated, if you remember, at the point from whence this conversation diverged, that the pleasures through the sight and through hearing cannot be beautiful in that by which each happened to be affected singly, and not both jointly, or both jointly, and not each singly, but by what they were affected jointly and singly, and hence you admitted that both together and each singly were beautiful. On this account, then, I conceived that, by the existence which follows upon both, they ought, if both were beautiful, to be themselves beautiful, but not by the existence wanting to the other. And I think so still. But tell me, as if at the beginning of our inquiry, if the pleasure through the sight and that through hearing are beautiful, both jointly and each singly, does not that which makes them so follow on both jointly and each singly? Hippias, certainly. Socrates, is it then because each singly is a pleasure, and both two jointly, that they are beautiful? Or, on this account alone, because all the other pleasures would be in no respect less beautiful? For, if you remember, the latter were shown to be pleasures no less than the former. Hippias, I remember it well. Socrates, but because these are through the sight and hearing, on that account it was asserted they were beautiful? Hippias, it was so asserted. Socrates, see now whether I speak the truth. It was stated, as my memory serves me, not that the pleasurable of every kind was beautiful, but such as was through the sight and hearing. Hippias, it is true. Socrates, does not this circumstance then attend on both taken together, but not on each taken singly? For by no means does each of them, as was said before, exist through both, but both through both, and each not. Is it so? Hippias, it is. Socrates, each of them is not beautiful through that which does not attend each, for the both does not attend upon the either, so that we can by the hypothesis call both beautiful, but we cannot call either so. Or, how say we, is it not of necessity so? Hippias, so it appears. Socrates, shall we then say that both are beautiful, but deny that each is so? Hippias, what is to prevent it? Socrates, this seems to me, my friend, to prevent it, because there were to us some things so appertaining to each, that if they appertained to both, they would appertain likewise to each, and if to each, to both likewise. All such you went through. Is it not so? Hippias, yes. Socrates, but what I went through were not so, of which was itself to each and the both. Is it so? Hippias, it is. Socrates, of what kind, then, Hippias, does the beautiful seem to you, whether, as you asserted, that if I and you are strong, both are so, and if I and you are just, both are so, and if both, so too is each, and similarly, if I and you are beautiful, both are so, and if both, so too is each, or is there nothing to prevent it, as in the case of numbers where some things taken together being even may be, when taken singly, odd, and perhaps even, or when each, being taken separately, is perhaps irrational, but taken both together may be rational, or perhaps irrational. And there are other things of this kind infinite in number, which I said presented themselves to me. Now, on which side do you place the beautiful, on that, as it appears to me, or to yourself? for it appears to me a great absurdity for both of us to be beautiful, yet each of us not so, or for each to be beautiful, yet both not so, or as regards any other thing whatever of such a kind. 
do you choose to say in this way or that? Hippias, in this way, Socrates, Socrates, and you do wisely, Hippias, in order that we may be freed from a further search, for if any of these things is the beautiful, the pleasurable which comes through the sight and hearing would no longer be the beautiful, for the pleasurable that comes through the sight and hearing causes both taken together to be beautiful, but not either singly. This, however, cannot be, as I and you, Hippias, have agreed. Hippias, we have agreed. Socrates, it is impossible then for that which is pleasurable through the sight and hearing to be the beautiful, since a thing being produced as beautiful exhibits something of the impossible. Hippias, such is the case. Socrates, say then again from the beginning, he will say, since you have erred in this, what to say you is that beauty which attends upon both these pleasures, for the sake of which you honoured them before the others, and called them beautiful? To me, Hippias, there seems a necessity to say that these are of all pleasures the most harmless, and the best, taken together and singly. Or have you to state anything else by which they are different from other pleasures? Hippias, by no means, for they are in reality the best. Socrates, this, then, he will say, do you now assert the beautiful to be, namely, pleasure that is advantageous? So it seems I shall answer, but what you? Hippias, I too the same. Socrates, is not, then, he will say, the advantageous that which is the efficient of good? Now, the efficient, as shown lately, is a thing different from the effect, and the reasoning has now come to you to the former reasoning, for neither would the good be a beautiful thing, nor would the beautiful be a good thing, since each of these is something else. This we shall more than all assert if, Hippias, we are of sound mind, for it is surely not just not to agree with him who speaks correctly. Hippias, but what, Socrates, do you conceive to be all this taken together? They are the pairings and snippings, as I said just now, of reasonings separated into little bits. But that is a thing both beautiful and of great worth to be able to put together well and beautifully a speech before a court of justice, or the council hall, or any other official tribunal before whom the speech may be addressed, and, after producing conviction, to depart, carrying off, not the least, but the greatest of prizes, in the preservation of oneself and one's own property, and that of one's friends. These, then, you ought to lay hold of, and to bid adieu to such petty disputes, in order that you may not seem to be a simpleton by taking, as just now, trifles and inanities in hand. Socrates, you, my dear Hippias, are a happy man, for you know what pursuits a simpleton should follow, and have followed them, as you say, sufficiently. But the misfortune of an evil genius, as it seems, lays hold of me, who am wandering continually and in doubt. For when I make a display of my doubts before you wise men, I am ever bespattered with dirt by you when I make a display. For ye tell me what you tell me now, that I busy myself about matters foolish, trivial, and worthless. But when, on the other hand, convinced by you, I say as ye do, that it is by far the best thing to be able to put together well and beautifully a speech, and to go through it before a court of justice, or any other concourse of people, I hear myself ill-spoken of in all ways, both by some others here, but especially from that person who is always confuting me, for he happens to be my nearest of kin, and lives in the same house. Whenever, then, I enter my dwelling at home, and he hears me talking in this way, he asks me if I do not feel a shame in presuming to converse about beautiful pursuits, after I have been so clearly convicted that on the subject of the beautiful I do not know what it is in the abstract. And how then, says he, will you know who has put together a beautiful speech or not, or done any other beautiful act, while knowing nothing of the beautiful? And when you are in such a situation, think you it is better for you to live than to die? Thus it has happened, as I told you, for me to hear myself ill-spoken of and reproached by you, and to be abused by him. But perhaps I must endure all this, for nothing is out of place 
if only I am benefited, and benefited, Hippias, I think I am, by my intercourse with both of you. For I seem to myself to understand what the proverb means. Difficult are the beautiful. End of Hippias Major